You be dead. The chilling words sent by text to a couple planning their wedding day. Police took it seriously. The person who was stalking them knew all about the wedding details. Uh, texts were received about a sniper would be there, the, the food's been poisoned. For Dr Jan Falkowski and his partner Debbie Pemberton, this was just the latest example of an escalating ordeal of harassment. The text got more and more threatening, and there then emails saying you'll be found dead, um, there'll be a gunman coming to the wedding. I actually did want to think about taking my life, um, and that's how serious it got. In a bizarre twist, the stalker went to extraordinary lengths to ruin Falkowski's life. Essentially, she went to my bins at my house in Epsom and to a condom and poured the contents of it inside her underwear. Now, police were investigating a rape allegation. Prosecutors were torn. Who was victim? Who was perpetrator? It's very difficult to get beyond DNA evidence. It seemed inconceivable to me that someone could get hold of someone's semen and plant it on their clothing. Jan Falkowski was suspended from practice and facing years in prison. He and Debbie Pemberton had become the victim of one of the most malicious types of harassers known to the police, the delusional stalker. Jan Falkowski is an achiever. One of the country's top psychiatrists, in his spare time, he's also won world-class powerboating events. He and Debbie Pemberton, a successful financial analyst, were planning on marrying. Somewhere along the line, they picked up a stalker. Whoever it was knew Debbie's telephone number and tricked her into revealing Jan's. I was leaving work one Friday afternoon at about five in the evening, and my fiancée at the time, Deborah Pemberton, rang me and said a friend of mine had rung her and wanted to check my mobile phone number. To start with, um, what happened is I actually got a general inquiry on the phone, somebody asking me to confirm my details, which I thought was very strange. Um, I thought it was the mobile phone company, um, just sort of cleaning up their records. The couple set off for their regular weekend trip to the Dorset coast. Almost immediately, they began to receive texts and calls. On the train on the way down, we started to get odd texts, um, and I'd get one and she'd get one. The text messages really became quite violent, malicious, and extremely threatening. The next day, things got worse. Then we started to get phone calls. Her phone would ring, then my mobile, then her mobile, then my mobile, which I thought was all rather odd. On initial inspection, it would seem that it was a jealous ex-lover um, or a woman that had a crush on Yan. And then we got a text saying they'd get us. They were things like, Tot, you're going to die, prepare for a funeral, not a wedding. If you go ahead with this wedding, then um, all your guests are going to die, the hotel's going to be blown up. And then somebody rang and said they knew Debbie's address, at which stage we were quite worried. So we didn't know how on earth somebody had got both my phone number and Debbie's phone number and why they're ringing both of us. So at that stage, we were quite worried. A few minutes later, my mother rang and said, just terribly sorry, but she'd given the florists Debbie's address in pool because I'd forgot to send her some flowers. And clearly, with hindsight, that's how whoever it was managed to get Debbie's address. From out of nowhere, Jan and Debbie had for 24 hours suffered a barrage of texts and silent phone calls, followed by menacing messages. This had all happened without any warning. I was started receiving um, 10 text messages within the space of a, a probably about a two hour period and a constant barrage on the phone of phone calls and text. So we went to the police station and reported it because the texts were getting more threatening and oddly enough, while we were in the police station telling them what was going on, we got some threatening texts, both on my phone and Debbie's phone. I seem to remember the text messages were very loving towards Jan and were very, um, not vicious at the time, but they were quite nasty towards Debbie. So um, instantly you think it's a, a female with some attraction, that's what you would think. And they were the sort of conclusions I drew at the time. Uh, but we had leads because we had the, the, the number that the text messages, so I thought as simple as finding out where they came from. 
In fact, the stalker, thought to be a woman, was covering her tracks, and the number and level of threats increased. The ordeal was to last a very long time. It carried on then for sort of months and months, really. Um, the texts were often uh, threatening or abusive. Um, some were saying, you know, enjoy your last Christmas, you'll be dead, um, or there'll be somebody found dead. Um, and they were often containing bits of information about something I was doing or Debbie was doing, which we found very unsettling in terms of whoever it was clearly knew something about us or was able to find information out about us. The harassment continued for months. Police were baffled when the stalker uncovered personal details of the couple's lives. There was things that this person, who was not known until the date of her arrest, was privy to. For example, she would know dates when uh, Debbie Pemberton was going to get her, her teeth um, looked at at the dentist. At one stage, Debbie was getting her teeth whitened, and she got a text, something to do with getting her teeth whitened. Um, there are other texts saying that we'd be burnt um, or shot. We actually went through a phase of having to suspect everybody. That included um, family members, it included close friends, it included colleagues at work. Um, we had to basically go through questioning everybody in our mind, which actually probably was the most un unpleasant experience out of everything. That the fact that you have to think that you may not even be safe within the very close sort of family family circle. Debbie and Jan had chosen a hotel in Poole for their wedding reception, but whoever was stalking them discovered those plans and stepped up the campaign of intimidation as the day grew nearer. Before the wedding, Debbie got text saying she should be burnt alive in a wedding dress, and we got text saying there's a gunman coming to the wedding on a yacht and he'd shoot people. Texts were received about a sniper would be there, the, the food's been poisoned, the chef at the hotel was approached by uh, a woman with a South African or Spanish accent um, inquiring about the cake, etc. Um, Debbie Pemberton's address had been visited, a note had been put underneath the door. I actually did want to think about taking my life, um, and that's how serious it got because to me that was the only way out, um, and it's the only way that I could actually stop this from hurting everybody else as, as, as well as me. There was still little to go on as to who the stalker was. She'd hit upon a means of stalking which prevented a trace. It didn't look like a phone number, it was sort of six or seven digits long. We submitted that through our people that can trace these calls, and it, it came back as, um, I think it was an internet number. It, it looked like a text message that had been routed through an internet, and therefore we have no way of tracing it. So straight away that was a little bit odd for somebody to go to such extremes, and really it was from there that it started snowballing. Whoever it was was clearly very organised um, and was very good at sort of not giving any clue away about who they were. To flush out the stalker, Jan and the police asked BT to block calls made from withheld numbers. Eventually, the stalker called from traceable phone boxes. Once they blocked withheld numbers from their phone, the person that was doing this had to change the way that they were making the calls, and that's when it moved on to public phone boxes, which we can trace because the numbers would come through. So, um, we were aware that emails and phone calls and text messages were coming from the, the old multimedia BT boxes. And we were able to um, locate these quite easily through BT as to where these were, which was, then began to give us a pattern of the person's movements. The pattern was telling. The stalker would make her silent calls from phone boxes which gave away that she was following Jan Falkowski and Debbie Pemberton. Each weekend, the couple would leave London for pool. What we could trace was that on certain days there would be a phone call or a text message or an email from somewhere in London at a railway station. It tended to be Liverpool Street or it tended to be Waterloo. Subsequently, there would be a gap for two hours then they would start in Poole or Bournemouth. Um, there would be a series around Poole or Bournemouth, and then they would sign off for two hours, then there'd be one more back in London. You could see there was clearly a train journey involved. So that sort of focused our attention really on, on phone boxes. 
we knew that this person had been coming to Paul because we were able to trace the numbers through the telephone boxes that were, were being used. Um, there, was, there was no um, set pattern to uh, that, that person coming to Paul, but it was generally on a Saturday. So, you know, my first thoughts were, well, you know, we've got nothing to lose here. We don't know who's doing this. It's probably a female. What we'll do is we'll do some co kind of covert surveillance on um, telephone boxes, Paul Railway Station, places that we knew that this person had previously visited. The hunt for the stalker was stepped up after the intensity of intimidation increased. Jan Falkowski, who lived on a boat when in London, discovered break-ins. Because the campaign went on for sort of 18 months nearly, and I used to stay on a boat in London at the time, and somebody went on, on the boat on one occasion and turned the lights on. On another occasion they went on the boat and turned the gas on when we weren't on the boat. So clearly not only did they sort of know a lot about what we were doing, but knew where I lived and where Debbie lived, and knew where my boat was in London. Two police forces were now investigating the stalker. Now at that time, Dorset Constabulary had the primacy on the investigation. And uh, the Metropolitan Police in Tower Hamlets were dealing with an allegation of the gas being turned on on Dr Falkowski's boat. So uh, Dorset took primacy and we were over looking at what was happening with that case. Meanwhile, with Dr Falkowski and Debbie Pemberton due to be married, and with increasing levels in menace being shown by the stalker, a decision had to be taken about the wedding day, a decision which eventually uncovered the identity of the stalker. During the course of the spring, the emails and texts became more and more abusive and more and more threatening. Um, so in the end, we decided not to get married. To me, uh, it was obvious, you know, what this person wanted to do was to come down on the wedding day and try and, and do something to disrupt the wedding. Well, our advice was not to go ahead with the wedding. There'd been too many threats made. Um, but we had to try and make sure that that information did not get out to that person. And we didn't know where they were getting the information from, so um, Debbie, Jan, all the guests were informed that the wedding wasn't taking place, but had to, con had to carry on and pretend it was, which was very difficult for Debbie and Jan. It was a very emotional time. An intricate sting was set up by Dorset Police. They were ready to gamble that the stalker would turn up for the reception on the wedding day of Jan Falkowski and Debbie Pemberton, and that she'd use her telltale method of harassment calls from phone boxes. Would they flush her out? I just believed in my own mind something was going to happen on that wedding day. If I was going to forgo that one of the days it was meant to be the happiest day of my life, I actually was only going to do it if I was going to get something out of it. I wanted it in court. Jan Falkowski and Debbie Pemberton had planned on getting married, but a mystery stalker had ruined their lives with texts, emails and silent telephone calls. Their stalker had even uncovered details of their marriage day plans. It turned out our stalker had actually been to the hotel where the wedding was going to be held, um, and had been to see the chef, um, and had sort of been going down to the south coast. Everything we did for the wedding had to be password protected because she tried to cancel the wedding four times. Um, so in the hotel were fully aware of this. Um, they would always notify me every time that the stalker up the ante there as well. For example, like sort of threatening to poison the guests, etc. The day that was meant to be the happiest day of my life was actually going to be an absolute nightmare and a trauma. Even if we could get it to go ahead and run smoothly, this is not going to be like any other normal wedding day. Um, I would be waiting for something to happen. So we decided the only thing we could do was really was to postpone the wedding. I'd spent over £2,000 on a dress, so I'd booked the venue, we had everything. This is three weeks to go and having to cancel. Um, it was extremely upsetting. I felt very angry that somebody I didn't know could actually walk into my life and absolutely ride roughshod over me and, and, and it get in the way. The identity of the stalker was a mystery. All Dorset police had to go on was a vague description from the chef at Sultan's Hotel and a report of a mysterious woman turning up at a boating event. A phone call had been made. Um, a person wasn't picked up on, on CCTV, but we had a description of somebody who approached um, Jan's group short lady, foreign looking, um, no more than that, no, no, no real age, no greater description than that. But um, it did actually match some of the, the text that were being sent. You know, they, they were sort of sent in sort of pidgin English, almost as if the person's first language wasn't, 
wasn't actually English. So we had a description of a female, a short female, foreign looking, and that was really all we had. Police now felt that their only chance of catching the stalker was to set up an elaborate sting. Her texts had revealed that she was obsessed by the marriage of Falkowski to Pemberton. In everything she had intimated in, in terms of the text messages and the phone calls, um, the way that she had behaved, it indicated that this day was absolutely the focus of her entire campaign. So it was the one day she knew exactly where we were going to be, what we were going to be doing, um, and it seemed that because it was so important to her, that in actual fact we could pinpoint it to this location. The plan really was actually to make it appear like the wedding was going to continue. So the hotel were on board with, with uh, the wedding plan, the florists were on board with the wedding plan, and we actually did nothing to make this person think that the wedding wasn't going to take place. I sort of thrown all my eggs into one basket, really thinking that this person's got to come down for the wedding. This is what it's all about for this person. We had police officers at my parents' address. We had a police officer in my own flat. We had um, police officers staked out at telephone boxes across Poole, which he'd used before. Um, and I do believe that police leave had been cancelled in Poole on that weekend to actually undergo the operation. You know, it was all now or never, really. Um, if the wedding day passed without incident, then we didn't really know where we were going to take the inquiry because, you know, all our efforts to identify the person had, had failed so far. The day of the fake wedding reception arrived. I was extremely nervous. You know, it's like any time you want the phone to ring, it never, it never rings. So there was a, this whole waiting process as well. And because the police, uh, the stalker was very, very smart and had warned us not to, to contact the police, she was in control and one step ahead. Despite the violence of the stalker's texts, there was a sense of expectation. It was a, an exciting day. It was a, a nervous day. It was, it was the day we were hoping finally after seven, eight months to find out who was behind um, this harassment. On the morning of the Saturday when we would have been getting married, there was a flurry of texts first thing in the morning about 8, 8.30. The first call we got that day was um, ironically from Bournemouth, which is a couple of stops down the train line from Poole. Um, as soon as we got that phone call, we thought, well, are we going to miss any more in Bournemouth? Our DI, DI Thorpe, sent a unit straight over to Bournemouth to try and pick up the person there. As luck would have it, as they arrived in Bournemouth, we received a phone call from Poole. So we were left with a small amount of resources immediately in Poole than we initially anticipated. It was just another one of those things at the time that if it could go wrong, it probably was going to go wrong. Bournemouth's two stops down the line from Poole and on the way there's a railway station called Parkstone Railway Station. The position of Parkstone Railway Station is very close to where Debbie was living at the time and it was also, it's in a, a little village area which is where the florist was that they were using for the wedding. Now we know the florist had, had phone calls and we also knew that Debbie's flat had been visited at some stage because a note had been left under the door. So um, Mr Thorpe and I came down to the railway station to see if she was going to get off at Parkstone and maybe revisit some of the places she'd been before. Police deployed resources to Poole High Street near the Sultan's Hotel. The hotel where the, where the wedding and reception was taking place is, is accessible to Poole High Street and the key is walkable from there. So we assumed this person was going to be in the high street somewhere. Um, at some stage heading towards the hotel. Poole's telephone boxes held the key to the success of the operation. The two detectives returned to base. It was just the sheer anticipation of waiting for phone calls to come in because the, you know it wasn't every minute. It was there might be 10 or 15, there might be three in one go and then a 10 or 15 minute gap before the next one. And we were relying on a little bit of, of luck. There's no way we could cover every single phone box in Poole with officers. So what we were doing was um, covering as many as we can at the time, and we were just waiting. And I think there must have been four, maybe five calls on the day where we just didn't have an officer anywhere near at the time. And by the time the officers turned up, the person had gone. Paul, on a Saturday afternoon in September, it was a hot sunny day, there were plenty of people about. You know, it was like you know, trying to find the needle in the haystack scenario, really. But the one thing we did have was things in place in, in, in event that a call was made from a certain location. So phone calls were made from the high street from telephone boxes. 
we'd be able to identify who was making them. At 11 minutes to 12, the breakthrough. I think it was a phone call to Debbie's parents. It was a silent call, but it was clearly a phone box that had made the call. They contacted me. I realised it was one down by Pool Key. Um, I, I put that out over the, over the radio to see if anybody was nearby. And uh, an officer called up and said, I'm actually stood outside that phone box now. There was a, a female who left the telephone box almost directly after the phone call had been made. So we had the time and the location. Um, the female came out of the telephone box and we made the decision straight away that this must be the person who, who was responsible for the harassment. Um, and we made the decision to, to arrest her. It was a, you know, it's a fantastic feeling because it's just, wait there, wait there. Don't let the person leave. And Maria Marchese walked out of the phone box. She was about to board a boat trip that goes around the island, so potentially we could have lost her for an hour, maybe two. Um, and she was arrested on that boat. And it was an incredible satisfaction, it was at the time, because we were able to say instantly then, we've got the right person. Well, the first thing was I got a phone call from Debbie saying the police had been on to her and said they'd arrested a stalker in the phone box, uh, making a call at the time. So that was great, we were both very relieved. I went round to Debbie, who was at her parents. Once it actually, we got that phone call to say, yeah, she's in custody, the relief um, was immense. Um, you know, I burst into tears, but there was still that, can, do they have the evidence to pin her down? And we then had an extended wait of a couple of hours uh, up until actually, you know, they found out what she was doing and why was she doing it. Then they told me it was a woman called Maria Machese, and I had no idea who she was. The identity of the stalker now seemed clear. It had to be Maria Marchesa. Police raided her home to collect evidence. Her home address was searched and um, a, a number of incriminating items were found, including uh, pieces of paper with the names of Dr. Falkowski's boats, which she had also stated in text that had a bomb on them. The Salton's Hotel brochure, uh, with the phone number of the head chef who she'd been phoning and spoke to. So uh, a number of things to, to put to her when she was interviewed, and she was interviewed over a, um, a length of time, and she totally denied the allegation. As well as evidence linking her with trips to pool, detectives also uncovered the missing link. How did Marchesa know Dr. Falkowski? She was in some kind of relationship with a, with a male who lived down the road from her, who was actually a patient of um, Jan Falkowski at his hospital. Marchese was barely known to Falkowski, yet she had waged a campaign against him and his partner for nearly a year. Detectives seemed to have all the evidence they needed to charge her with harassment. They kept her in custody. I was really concerned about whether we should let her out on bail whilst you know, the risks still were being posed to Debbie and Jan. And in the end, we made a decision that we would charge her with um, harassment of, of Debbie and Jan. After she was arrested on the 6th of September, Debbie Pemberton received no further phone calls, texts, anything like that. And neither did her family. There was no doubt at whatsoever that it, this was the right person. It was when we realised that she had a partner in London that was being treated by Jan Falkowski that there was a link. So we then had the link, the person in the phone box, that was the right person. Both the Met and Dorset police were now convinced about Marchesa's guilt, but she flatly denied having anything to do with harassing Falkowski and Debbie Pemberton. We interviewed her then over, I think, about six or seven hours, and um, she just denied it was her, and it was almost like a flat feeling at the end, because you just want to know why. She had been quite cunning, she had been quite clever. When we searched her flat in London, there was nothing that directly linked her to Jan Falkowski or Debbie Pemberton. Prosecutors need to be confident that they will win a case before they agree to take a suspect to court. Marchese's refusal to confess, despite what seemed proof of her guilt being put to her, frightened off the CPS in Dorset. I think they were concerned that what we had was lots and lots of circumstantial evidence and uh, a decision was made uh, at some point um, at, a, at a court hearing that actually we didn't have enough at that moment in time to proceed with, with the case and um, the decision by CPS was actually to discontinue the matter. I have to say, looking at it now, I'm not surprised. We knew we had the right person, as I say, 
but we were left with one phone box, one call on one day. That was all we had. We could not link her to anything else. Much to my horror, in December that year, I got a letter from the CPS in Dorset saying they'd decided to drop the case against her because they didn't think there's enough evidence. We had been assured from anybody who'd actually come into contact with the case that this was absolutely horrific and that, you know, if you put it before a jury, that the jury would absolutely rule that this, this was harassment. So when we actually, I actually got the letter to say that um, the CPS had decided not to go ahead with this, um, I had a mixture of emotions, extreme anger, absolute upset and fear. When she was released from, um, from bail because the case was dropped, I, I, I don't think it's going over the top to say that it, it ripped, it ripped the, the bottom out of their world almost because they knew she was back out and would, was not going to face any prosecution for this. Um, it was very difficult to explain to them exactly why. As soon as Marchesa was released from custody, the texts and the silent phone calls began again. And far from ending the ordeal, Marchese's arrest was to escalate the suffering faced by Dr. Falkowski. When she was arrested the second time for stalking, um, she then, during the course of interview with the police, claimed that I'd raped her in 2002. She passed out, although she had visions of Dr. Falkowski on top of her and saying it's going to be okay. When the rape allegation was made, it was almost, you, well, you just couldn't believe it. I was sort of suspended from work. I wasn't allowed to contact my colleagues. Um, I was sort of placed on bail. I couldn't go abroad, had my passport taken away. So I had all sorts of um, things done to me and I was actually the innocent victim all along. Jan Falkowski and his partner Debbie Pemberton had been relentlessly stalked by a woman the police believed was Maria Marchesa, a partner of one of Dr. Falkowski's psychiatric patients. Despite an elaborate and successful sting operation to catch Marchesa, prosecutors had decided there was not enough evidence to charge her. The pressure on Falkowski and Debbie Pemberton, who'd planned on marrying, was intense the couple split. As the stalking progressed, um, and probably up to the point, you know, not long after the stalker was caught, uh, essentially I was a shell, devoid of life, um, just a, a kind of almost like a skeleton, sick, pale, um, just wanted to fade into the shadows in the background. If you'd have said boo to me, I'd have jumped out of my skin. Um, I didn't want to be noticed. Um, I, the, the phone, the mobile phone, actually became a, a sort of an instrument of torture and terror. It sort of drove a wedge between us. We didn't really know who was stalking us or why. Um, and by the time they arrested Marchese, I think the damage had already been done. I just wanted to be rid of the whole situation. Um, so I left London and I made the decision to go abroad. Um, one, because I couldn't see any way forward out of this. And then secondly, I wanted to be protected. And I actually wanted to live in a country that actually stood for justice. Falkowski's ordeal was about to get worse. Suddenly, despite regular interviews with police without mentioning it, Morea Marchesa alleged to detectives that she had been raped by Falkowski two years earlier. And she had the evidence to prove it. It was completely unbelievable that um, Marie had made this allegation of rape. I, I just couldn't believe it because she had the opportunity when she was here to say that. She had the opportunity then to tell us that this is what it was about and she never had. And albeit that I knew there was a link between Maria Marchese and Jan Falkowski because he was treating her partner, it just seemed incomprehensible that there was any kind of sexual relationship that had ever gone on between them. It just didn't seem right. So when the rape allegation was made, it was almost, you, well, you just couldn't believe it. Um, but the evidence will out and, and, it, and it will prove one way or another. Having denied ever having any sort of relationship with Marchese, compelling evidence now suggested Falkowski was a liar who'd fooled everyone. She produced to us 
uh, her underwear that she allegedly wore at the time, which was sent up for analysis, and in the crotch area of the knickers was found the semen of Dr. Borkowski and the DNA of Maria Marchese. The CPS decided to pursue the rape allegation. It's very difficult to get beyond DNA evidence. It seemed inconceivable to me that someone could get hold of someone's semen and plant it on their clothing. Maria Machesa was asking police to believe that Dr. Falkowski had drugged her and then moved her in broad daylight to her flat before raping her. At least one investigating officer was skeptical. Dr. Falkowski would have had to carry a lifeless body down a flight of stairs from a Victorian building, place her into his sports car, drive her to her block of flats, again walk her up three flights of stairs to her flat and put her into bed and undress her there. She then claims that her underwear was placed in her handbag. She stated that after the attack uh, she'd kept these under her bed um, in a plastic bag and she'd bought them for our attention. The overwhelming evidence was the DNA evidence, and that's what had started the prosecution. Essentially, they put the stalking on a back burner and did nothing about it. Um, and they then investigated her allegations against me. Well, I was asked to come into the police station for an interview, and I'd been in lots of times in terms of complaining about Marchese and the stalking. And they said, well, fine, what's the problem? They said, well, there isn't one. I said, it sounds slightly odd. Um, do you think I should bring a solicitor? So I think that's probably a good idea. So I then turned up um, with solicitor and was amazed when they said that there's an allegation that Marchese had made that she'd been raped. I just couldn't believe it. It was almost um, as if it was sort of, you know, fantasy. Dr. Fulkowski was arrested in February of 2004 and he denied the allegation. Um, and then his DNA was taken. That was sent away. And then when he came back and was interviewed a second time, he was charged. I was suspended from work, I wasn't allowed to contact my colleagues, um, I was placed on bail, I couldn't go abroad, had my passport taken away. Since splitting with Debbie Pemberton, Falkowski had begun to date a woman called Bethan Ansel. She knew about the stalking and decided the rape allegation was part of Machese's tactics. Although we were very, very shocked, obviously, we knew the background, we knew everything that had happened beforehand, we obviously knew that Marchese had been um, was his stalker, so we just thought, well, police have to follow procedures. They're obviously put in place so that real victims and women who've gone through this are protected. But just thought, okay, we've just got to get through it. Everyone's going to realise what happened, that there's no truth in it whatsoever, and it will very quickly be resolved. And if anything, it's going to give the police more evidence against Marchese to finally convict her. As time went on, and it sort of continued um, I was got more and more worried about it because clearly, you know, it wasn't sort of going away and the police hadn't resolved it, so I just couldn't believe what was happening, really. We will treat all allegations of rape as, as true until we get evidence which suggests that there's something wrong with the story. It was incredibly frustrating to know that she'd made a false allegation. They were taking her seriously, and it seemed they'd dropped the stalking in the meantime. That just got left on back burner. When they said the DNA's there of Jan and her, it was almost kind of like, oh God, what's the bigger implication of this? And surely, still, she's just been being really clever. Falkowski's nightmare was continuing until Marchese's biggest mistake was uncovered. The underwear she'd allegedly kept for two years bearing his DNA revealed something else, a third DNA trace. It came back from the lab that the semen was Dr. Falkowski's and the um, DNA was Marchese's. And there was a, an unknown strand of DNA in, in the mixture as well. Three weeks before his trial, I think it was August the 15th, experts from the defence came up with a statement to say that this unknown strand belonged to Beth and Ansel. He didn't start seeing her until 11 months after Marchese had alleged the rape had taken place. Gradually, a theory emerged about how Marchese had obtained Dr. Falkowski's semen. 
essentially she went to my bins at my house in Epsom and took a condom and poured the contents of it inside her underwear. The third DNA trace effectively exonerated Jan Falkowski, but still the case was pursued by the CPS. It just takes so, so long from the DNA, the third DNA being identified. It's like, great, okay, marvellous. So for me, I'd think, great, well, that's it, but it, that's not it. And that's, well, how did it get there and who is it? And it's got to be analysed. And then um, both sides have to analyse it and everyone has to get independent experts. And even when you almost think, okay, great, this is it, this is over, it, it, that doesn't mean it is. And, um, and then obviously it's down to, to the lawyers, the barristers and the solicitors to think, well, you know, do we let this go to court and then bring and then really push the importance of this third DNA or do we let the CPS work it out themselves? Do we trust the, the process to kind of work as it should do and work out that, hey, my DNA's there, we didn't meet for a year after Marchese claimed this happened, so therefore, with everything else, it couldn't possibly have been Yan. And that's just... I mean, that's just logic. That, you don't have to have half a brain to work that, out that that's what happened. Yeah, it took, it took an awful lot of pushing until the day, the day, the Friday before the trial was due to start for them to drop the case. And that was quite a long time after the third DNA had been identified. The episode had angered Falkowski's friends and his new partner. Their anger was directed towards the Crown Prosecution Service. It's like a cartoon. It is just so unbelievable that someone who's supposed to be so intelligent, who is, you know, upholding our legal system, who is making decisions and is putting away the bad guys and it supposedly has the brain, the intellect, to look at all the practical evidence and apply and, and be human at the same time and apply reasoning, rationality to the evidence and to, to for him to get it so, so wrong is just, it, it beggars belief. For Malcolm Davis, who'd always harboured severe doubts about the rape allegation, the justice system had let Falkowski down. What this woman did to Dr Falkowski was turn his life upside down and almost completely ruin it. She was quite happy to go to the papers to blacken his name. She was obviously more than happy to make this allegation against him, even though it was totally untrue. But allegations such as this live with you. He doesn't get anonymity, so his name was in the papers over an allegation of rape. And even though he's been cleared, that allegation is still there. It still lives with someone, the fact they've been arrested for rape. Maria Marchesa had stalked Jan Falkowski for years, ruined his relationship with a woman he had planned to marry, and falsely accused him of rape. But far from ending her bizarre behaviour, she was to simply change the identity of her stalking victim. The prosecutor, who had decided to drop the rape case, was about to suffer the Marchese treatment. The police officer who was dealing with the case said that she was the most dangerous woman he'd ever dealt with. She's not mad, she's not crazy, she's just evil. They built a panic room in my bedroom at home and a button through to the police station. I had real concerns and I didn't sleep very well. For the six weeks it took to get all the security um, sorted and uh, installed. A condom stolen from the bins of Dr. Jan Falkowski had led to a rape investigation and his eventual arrest. DNA evidence first implicated him and then cleared him. The woman behind the elaborate scheme had previously stalked Dr. Falkowski for years. Now members of the prosecuting team were to be harassed by Maria Marchese. Maria Marchese found out that the case had been dropped on the same day we dropped it and um, she was attempting to ring me, attempting to speak to the CPS lawyer, Kay Scudder. Marchesa, angry at the decision to drop the rape charge, deluged to the prosecutor who'd taken the decision with telephone calls. They came through to my extension, just telling me I'd made the worst decision in the history of the CPS and I had to do, uh, reverse that decision. She wanted to know why the case had been dropped. The calls often lasted in excess of an hour and, and eventually 
the switchboard um, had to intercept all my calls so that I couldn't receive any more calls from her. I certainly didn't know what this woman was capable of and I wasn't prepared to take any risks. Marchesa, as she had with Dr Falkowski, escalated her harassment. When the calls were no longer successful, that's when she turned up at the office and uh, told our reception staff that she had a meeting with me and she wanted to see me. She became quite aggressive and the police officer who was dealing with the case said that she was the most dangerous woman he'd ever dealt with, that there was a risk to me and other people involved in the case and the fact that she'd not been able to make contact with me in person or have a meeting would probably exacerbate matters. I was advised to change my journeys into work, to come in at different times, to use different routes, to come into casual clothing, and I did that for a number of weeks. They built a panic room in my bedroom at home and a button through to the police station, um, reinforced the front door, put CCTV there. Marchese had so far escaped any criminal charges. With Dr Falkowski exonerated, that could now change. I felt almost a, a duty to Dr Falkowski to A, get him back on side with us because we'd charged him, and B, to get it through to a successful conclusion by getting her convicted. Ironically, Dr Falkowski's acquittal made the job facing police and prosecution harder. It was decided that, unless she was arrested quickly, publicity surrounding the case could be prejudicial and rule out a future trial. During that four weeks, it was uh, quite hectic. I had three officers working with me who were working um, long hours, just and, but working for the same calls. And everybody knew this story by now, the story of Maria Marchese and what she'd done. But everybody worked extremely hard to, to uh, bring that case to fruition. Police and prosecutors had to decide whether Marchese, who'd exhibited bizarre behaviour, was fit for trial. What sort of a person was she? Mad? or bad? I think she's evil. I think she's bad, not mad. She was very, very clever in what she did. Um, and I think that she's probably had a real, she's had many, many years to develop these skills. She is an extremely calculating and evil woman. Um, and I think that's as far as you need to go in trying to explain it. I don't think there's any um, need to sort of understand it further. There's nothing wrong with her, she's just inherently evil and unfortunately um, most, pe most people don't come across people like that in their everyday lives and some people do and she came across Jan. Marchese was charged with harassment, threatening to kill and perverting the course of justice and was sentenced to nine years in prison. When she did get found guilty it was the end of almost I think five years four or five years of, of police work that had finally come to, to fruition and it was a very exciting day. It was closure and I'm not just talking about closure for myself, it was closure for Jan Falkowski and Debbie Pemberton and Beth and Ansel and all their family and friends who, who had suffered as well at the hands of this woman um, who to this day still denies that she's done any wrong. The relief was actually phenomenal. Um, it was probably one of the most emotional days <laughs> I've ever ex experienced because it meant that it had been identified that she had done something absolutely awful and really horrific and that I was going to be safe for the next nine years. Um, I'm very pleased she's been given the long sentence and I think that reflects the seriousness of what she did. This story has a happy ending in that she's in prison and she's in the right place. She's been identified publicly, so hopefully that will put an end to any damage she can do in the future. For it to have um, grown into the case that it did, taking the twists and turns along the way, unless it was real life, I don't think people would believe it. I've certainly not been involved in anything like this before. I'd be incredibly surprised if I ever got involved in anything like this again. There's only true life that can be um, this unbelievable. Jan Falkowski had suffered years of harassment, lost a partner he was due to marry, been accused of rape in bizarre circumstances, and been unable to continue working as a top London psychiatrist. He had been a complete innocent in an intricate, spiteful campaign of harassment and abuse by a woman he had barely known. I think the victim of stalking, I think, is still taken, um, it's taken rather lightly. And I think the problem is some stalking can be incredibly serious and, you know, 
devastate somebody's life. But I think people still view stalking as being slightly amusing. You know, haven't you had a stalker too, almost, is the sense you have sometimes. Um, and I think the problem is that does sort of camouflage the fact, in some cases, can be extremely serious. Today, Jan Falkowski is back at work as a psychiatrist and settled in his new relationship with Bethan. It has now been revealed that Maria Marchese had stalked another man before Falkowski. Stalking is something some people can't resist. While she's in Holloway, I feel okay, and there's been no communication from prison. But my concerns are that when she's released, I might be at risk again. I'm concerned in terms of if she starts trying to stalk me again, or indeed she might go and stalk somebody else, and that she did stalk somebody before me. So I'm worried about that. On the other hand, hopefully, if she does do anything, the authorities will act very quickly um, to deal with it. Maria Marchesa is due for parole in 2012.